I'm just like sitting. Welcome everybody to this evening public lecture, which is part of our final uh, celebratory event for CODAL, the ARC Centre of Excellence for the Dynamics of Language. I'm Nick Evans, the director of CODAL, and we will hear tonight a uh, lecture from Clint Bracknell, who is Professor of Indigenous Languages at the University of Queensland. The title is there, Wabranara, Invigorating the Community of Speakers via Performance. But before we do that, our first uh, task is to uh, invite um, Shane Halloran, who is a Ngunnawal elder and will give us the welcome to country. So Shane, this is the second time you've been here today. Some, some of us were here this morning for your welcome. Others have just come in and thanks for coming along twice in one day. Using that term elder loosely, I'm trying to hold on to my youth as long as I can. <laughs> With permission from my elders, I say, Yuma, Yuma Lundi, Yangu Nalawini, Duni Manya, Munuawari, Dawadawari. Hello and welcome today we're here in Ngunnawal country. My name is Shane Halloran, I'm a Ngunnawal man. I'm a descendant of the Namich and the Wallabalua clans of the Ngunnawal people. I acknowledge my ancestors and my elders who are the traditional custodians of the region encompassing Canberra, the ACT and surrounds. The Ngunnawal people pay our respects to our traditional neighbours, the Gadangada to the northeast, the Wogaloo to the south, the Wiradjuri to the west, the Yuan to the east, and the Ngarugo to the southeast. We know that a welcome to country is an ancient Aboriginal protocol that ensures that once welcomed, your body and spirit are protected whilst on another's land. The Ngunnawal people welcome you and call on our ancestors to provide your safe journey during your time in country. Injumara Dawara, Injumara Gulawa. As we show our respect for the land and the people around us, we know the same respect will be shown to us. As we approach the 10th month of the first year of the International Decade of Indigenous Languages, I reflect on the journey of the Ngunnawal people during the revitalization of our ancient language and its effect on our community. I see parallels with the 2007 re report done by Hallett, Chandler and Lalonde uh, with the correlation reduction of self-harm in community within the indigenous people of British Columbia and Canada where they are actively working on the language revival as the conversational knowledge group so did the well-being of the people. And the connection to the language fosters a greater connection to the land and to the culture. One noticeable outcome of this was the decline in youth suicide and self-harm. It became apparent to the elders that the youth were forming a better sense of self-identity and their place in their communities. But well, there's now hope that the renewed connection with language can foster a new mindset with ancient connections. We, the Ngunnawal people, have an ancient connection with this land. In the past, we've been denied access to connection, an ancient connection that all of us can draw from, not just the Ngunnawal people. We have to encourage to move forward together to call out negative, old, closed-minded systems, to teach the people we work with as we work with them, to disregard the obstacles that contribute to an ever-widening gap. That takes courage. In being courageous, we're a direct link back to the dream time. This is the essence of Aboriginality, as is our relationship to the land and the people and creatures who live on this land. Yumalundi, Yalambani, Gajali, Injumara, Wanange, Naraganawai. I say welcome as we respectfully come together to look, listen, and learn. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shane. And you couldn't have been here today, but a lot of the themes you raised this morning have been coming up again and again, and more that you've talked about now will do the same. So uh, I'll now uh, introduce uh, tonight's speaker, Professor Clint Bracknell. And uh, Clint has a very interesting 
background as a new young man who started out working as an ESL and music teacher and uh, then went on to establish uh, the major in Indigenous knowledge at the University of Western Australia and then uh, a PhD in Yungas Song at University of Sydney. Then he um, co-developed the major in contemporary music for Sydney Conservatorium of Music, returned to Western Australia at John Co uh, Edith Cowan University, sorry, on, on one, um, and uh, has now gone to uh, University of Queensland, where he holds the chair in uh, as a professor of Indigenous languages there. There's a lot I could say about Clint and the question of courage is one of the things uh, that comes up because uh, we've heard many times, we will hear many times of the challenges of reawakening sleeping languages or, or bringing uh, languages that aren't in a great state of health back into being spoken and while many people here as linguists know about describing and documenting languages that is by no means the same thing as knowing how to bring languages really back to life. If we're honest we've got to say we don't really know how to do it and that's where the courage to do you know bold things comes in and as just a couple of examples of what Clint has done in that space producing a, a translation with his wife Kylie of uh, Macbeth, Shakespeare's Macbeth into Nyunga the first time uh, a Shakespeare play has been translated in full into an Australian Indigenous language and then staging it with actors who had to be taught the language in some cases from scratch or close to from scratch that's the sort of thing that could get you sent to a madhouse in some places I think <laughs> but of course he pulled off um, Clint's interests run in a lot of directions as an ethnomusicologist music is clearly one of them and this includes both you know uh, popular music and traditional Aboriginal music has been involved in a number of projects there. It's also involved in, in the Nyingan project on uh, bringing a lot of old manuscript sources to life. And uh, I think the thing that runs through all of this is a realisation that language, if we are to revive it, if we're to use it, um, if we're to give people the uh, sense of really wanting to and being able to learn it back it has to touch our emotions in a powerful way that performance of music and drama does so uh, those things are some of the reasons that we were very uh, delighted when Clint kindly accepted uh, to come and give this um, public lecture tonight so thank you again Clint I know you have many calls on your time and we had some panics that some of those might prevail over this gig, but uh, you were kind enough. Of, oh, the one other thing I should mention is that Clint has been on the advisory board of CODAL, which has been a, a wonderful a privilege for us to have that uh, channel of advice, uh, as well as all of the other collaborations that are going on. So please join me in welcoming uh, Clint Bracken. Just been in a Teams meeting uh, 
since nine o'clock after getting on a plane from Brisbane at six o'clock. Um, so yeah, we'll see how we go. I, I said, see this word here, um, and I'm um, just thinking of everyone back home in Mungo country, um, in the south of WA. And that's a name that um, was suggested by Carl J. Morrison, who is, it wasn't my idea to do Macbeth. That's, that's completely Kyle. That's a, a, something that he just added on for more than a decade. And more than a few people call him crazy. Um, but, you know, he rallied everyone behind him and, and got it together. And uh, Wab is just play. And then we've just got all these lovely suffixes that we tend to have in languages from around here. And um, it's like sort of a play on Shakespeare's players, you know, and that's sort of what we call ourselves, uh, you know, to give us a bit of, bit of energy. Um, I was initially told I needed to talk for 90 minutes, so I've written a paper <laughs> if wants to publish it. Um, and just to get a sense of it, because I've, I've been around Codal a bit, um, and I've been around linguists a bit, and linguists get a bad rap, I think. Like a lot of linguists that, that have worked with um, with Nungas over the years, I think have been uh, pretty useful people. You know, um, one of them's um, sitting right there. Um, he's turned me on to a few tapes and stuff over, over the years. Um, but, you know, linguists know, know a lot already. So, who's a, a linguist in here? Could we have a show of hands, please? <laughs> Uh, and who's a brave uh, non-linguist who's shown up to this um, <laughs> merry event? Fantastic. Okay, that's good because I, I sort of thought, yeah, this is like a bit of a, a bit of a mix. So I'm going to bore half of you, and then I'm going to switch, and then bore the other half. <laughs> so um, yeah, I'm a newer. I'm I'm from. Uh, I was born in Albany, and. Um, I've got an ancestral connection across to as far along the south coast as, as Esperance. So beautiful country. Um, I've lived in Perth since I was about 17. Couldn't wait to get out of the small country town I grew up in. And um, have sort of just always been a muso. And that doesn't really pay the bills. So you start getting into other things. And then you get older and, and Triple J's not going to play you. And um, <laughs> you've got to start thinking of um, different ways to, to be useful. So that Nyungar region constitutes one of the largest Aboriginal cultural blocks in this land now known as Australia. In terms of its population and in terms of the vast estate of lands and waters that it occupies, including the capital city of Perth. Uh, Nyungar, um, there's a bit of conjecture around here, but um, share what's pretty much a common ancestral language with at least three overlapping regional dialects. As the first Aboriginal group in Western Australia to experience sustained foreign contact and the British invasion, Noongar bore the brunt of it. And um, successive government policies of segregation, cultural assimilation and, and all the rest. But despite staggering odds, Noongar continue to find ways to sing and speak in Noongar language. And the land now known as Australia, as we know, is home to enormous linguistic diversity with more than 200 distinct indigenous languages, again, subject to much conjecture, um, each of which is associated with a unique local region of people and around, what, 70,000 plus now, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Australia account for approximately 3% of the nation's total population, but Australia's continuing legacy of settler colonialism and successive cultural assimilation policies have combined to position most of these languages, these many, many languages, in various states of endangerment and silence. Although they seem to be the flavour of the what year, now decade, let's make it century. The linguist Arthur Capel explained in 1964 that government policy looks forward to the loss of Aboriginal languages so that the, as he says it, Aborigines may be assimilated. But half a century later, the um, 2014 National Indigenous Languages Survey indicates that only around 120 languages are still spoken and that about 13 can be considered strong in terms of being passed on to that very youngest of generations. Although we're starting to see a bit of a shift in what endangerment means. 
because there's this this renewed push right around to get things going. Sometimes working with many very minimal resources, and resources not just in a financial sense or a resource sense, um, but in those very human resources in the true sense of the word. How much energy have we got? And many communities are engaged in processes to revitalize and sustain their languages as they simultaneously respond to ongoing social, cultural, and economic marginalization. <clears throat> but these languages are not just important to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, but vital to maintaining intimate relationships with the unique and diverse <coughs> landscapes they emanate from. I'm going to take a bit of a detour from all this performance talk and um, talk a little bit about country. Languages can represent the distillation of the thoughts and communication of the people over their entire history. And for people from around here, that history can stretch back more than, what, 50,000 years. Way more. As distinguished senior Akare woman Margaret Kamare Turner explains, and thanks to Rachel Nordlinger for this quote, not only you speak that language, but generation upon generation upon generation of your families have also spoken it. And so language is really, really important. Your own language, and that language really recognises you. Gives you identity and who you are, and what is you, and how you're connected to that land, and how you hold the land. And in this context, land and country, often with a capital letter, Distinguished landscapes as nourishing terrains, living multi-dimensional and intertwined with culture. The relationship between country and language is reciprocal, and people often describe country as being happy when it hears the local language. The singer and scholar Lou Bennett considers language as something that belongs to country. Now, although English, the English language, does not belong to Australia, it dominates social, cultural and civic life here. Any language can be used to speak about all manner of topics in all kinds of ways, but settler colonists have imposed words like Australia, Aboriginal and Nomadic to codify a country and its peoples within a narrow and limiting world view. Aboriginal denies cultural and linguistic diversity. Nomadic undermines regionally specific indigenous systems of managing, owning, and understanding land. The term Australia can problematize both. As Tuck and Yang explained, to codify is to manage, to arrange in an order that is meaningful to the code. Coding is something we do to objects. Codes stand for objectified living things. Codes become objects themselves to be treated objectively in the way that living things would not allow. And a lot of people I talk to consider just about everything to be a living thing. Not an object. In this way, the English language has been used as a tool to deny the sovereignty and cultural diversity of peoples. It has also been used to perpetuate, not used to maybe, it's also possibly used to perpetuate a deficit vision of country. The lexicographer J. Arthur explains that because the English language is imbued with ideals and expectations associated with English landscapes from England, said the colonists have created this new country haunted by the image of the default country, which was narrow, green, hilly and wet, which meant that Australia was understood as vast, brown, flat and dry. Arthur finds the English language constantly disappointed in its descriptions of Australian landscapes, where drought is normal and waterways are periodically bare. Rather than using words predisposed to frame Australia in terms of deficiency, she asks if, there would be, if it would be better to have another language in which to more truly imagine Australia. Of course, we already have many of them. Unburdened by historical echoes of the English countryside, Aboriginal languages and Torres Strait Islander languages can ably describe their local landscapes, often in deep and profound ways. For example, we 
in Junger demonstrates or describes both a waterway and your belly button. Rather than creating expectations of England's brimming lakes and flowing rivers, this polysemy po poetically conveys the normal infrequency of local water supplies. It also intimately links landscapes to the body, humanizing country and countrifying humans. In Jungar, Kaat is your head, Bugal is your lower back, Kungat is your shoulder. Oh, sorry, I'll go there again. Kaat is your head and a hill. Bugal is your lower back and a knoll. Kungat is a shoulder or side of a hill. Bunich is an island and a knee. And Mar, we know that one, that's the common one. But in Jungar, it's also the wind. Nank is the sun. And in Jungar, unlike a lot of other languages, um, mother. Budjar is land, and Budjari is pregnant. Humanities researchers have long suggested that environmental crisis may not just be the result of law, science, and economics, but also a disconnection between culture and nature. Eco-musicologists, and that's what I think I'm, I'm heading towards, I like the way those guys think. You know, music's not disconnected to culture, it's connected to country too. Um, Aaron Allen, my colleague from the States, points out that environmental problems are not based entirely in scientific and technological understanding, rather they have both a scientific and a cultural root, and also scientific and cultural solutions. Ideally, a local language can underpin nuanced ecological understandings and encourage environmental stewardship or caring for country. A resurgence in the use of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander languages will not necessarily halt environmental <coughs> degradation. However, this kind of restorative cultural change could certainly increase the diversity of perspectives on how to appreciate and interact with local landscapes. Globally, the decline and death in Indigenous languages, Indigenous people and the natural world are inherently linked. Fire management practices are clearly environmentally significant, with their reduction since colonisation resulting in ecological change and increasingly catastrophic bushfires. Aboriginal expressive culture and Torres Strait Islander expressive culture has ecological importance too. The late, very dear songwriter Archie Roach sings on his album Into the Bloodstream, Heal the people, heal the land, and they will understand. It goes hand in hand. Country obviously sustains people. And if suitably inclined and informed, people can help sustain country. I don't want to get into polemics, but while a settler colonial worldview may, <clears throat> I guess by default, divide and separate nature, culture, and health. They're all interconnected, and if you undo one part, everything unravels. Rather than a one-dimensional desire for language revival, or music revival, or cultural revival, an ecological ethos underpins most of the determined efforts across the land now known as Australia to reinvigorate expressive culture. And performance is at the core of the most successful examples of Indigenous language revitalization worldwide in Hawaii and um, across in New Zealand. However, a language cannot be saved by singing a few songs. That old chestnut of a quote. And public performance is not necessarily an instant remedy for issues of language endangerment and intergenerational <coughs> trauma. Notwithstanding the diverse histories of Indigenous languages and challenges to their vitality, communities continue to value their languages highly. In some communities, languages may be so venerated that some individuals may not feel confident enough to engage in revitalization programs for fear of making mistakes. Jeannie Bell, the great Jeannie Bell, discusses how many Aboriginal people in Australia feel sadness, regret, and sometimes anger that we did not have the chance to speak the languages of the land. Trauma associated with the suppression or absence of language can inhibit language revitalization, and communities can be understandably wary of sharing. 
But in a short space of time, since the early 70s, the public and institutional denigration of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander languages and culture has given way to an interest and even a celebration. Suddenly, Indigenous languages and songs have become very important as evidence for native title. And emerging opportunities associated with tourism, land development, academia and the arts. However, Arundhati writer Celeste Little observes that in these domains, when language is used or gifted, it is either maimed through thoughtlessness and mispronunciation, or it is downright rejected. So this is where I'm from. The south of Western Australia, long home to Noongar people who carry living oral histories that chronicle the last ice age an expressive culture that was once routinely musical and intrinsically linked to local landscapes. Claimed by the British in 1829, became part of the nation state in 1901 with the rest. Over the past two centuries, most families have been marked by experience of sanctioned and arbitrary frontier violence, followed by rigorous government policies of segregation and assimilation. And the language has been dramatically impacted uh, since the early 1800s and was actively suppressed until the 1970s. Well over 30,000 people, getting close to 40,000, are new men. And they spell it in many different ways, almost as many as there are people. The need for Nyungar to serve as a catch-all term or only arose with colonisation. Describing people's lives before invasion, the late Nyungar leader, Ken Colburn, said that, well, those people existed where there was no necessity for any name. They were the good, the enlightened people. They were the people who know about the laws of nature and the laws of the spirit. They built a great civilization, a great culture, and a unique social order. So a big cultural block. But in the last Australian census, only 5% of Nyungar people reported that they use the language. Nevertheless, Professor Len Kai will be quick to point out that everyone's talking now. It's in place names like Joondla, Kulbala, Kwerdi, and with uh, colloquial terms to describe local fauna and flora, animals like the quokka and the tamara, trees like a jarra, using a gigi to go fishing. So lots of people talk now, not just humans. Still, the language is rarely heard strung together in full sentences and conversations. And at last glance, and this is a year or so ago now, um, the reference publication Ethnologue still listed Nyungar language as uh, dormant or extinct. In the south of WA today, arts organisations are increasingly uh, promoting agendas that are avowedly pro-Indigenous, pro-environmental and pro-sustainability. But they're also increasingly reliant on funding from environmentally destructive industries. The increased public acknowledgement of the Nyungar culture and language masks the fact that Nyungar remain the poorest and most incarcerated people in our own homelands, now one of the wealthiest places on earth. And although it remains critically endangered, um, those ABS census results are really telling. While this census data, this dramatic jump, does not account for fluency or frequency of use, it clearly demonstrates increasing identification with Nyungar language. This is not just Nyungar people, this is anyone that ticks the box. Sustained revitalization efforts since the 1980s reflect the importance of language to Nyungar identity. Key to this revitalization movement were senior language speakers, including the late Cliff Humphreys, Ned Mippy, Kathy Aaron, Hazel Winmar, and Peter Farmer Senior, whose son I spoke to last night who met together with supportive linguists, including Wolf Douglas, Alan Dench, Nick Teberger, to develop resources, officially recognised Nyungar as a single language with dialects, and develop a spelling system. Diversity of opinion on spelling reflects diversity in the use of language more generally, and um, the developers of one of the early Nyungar language kits, um, Glenis Collard and Sandra Waterton, explained that there are different dialects, at the present time, and each one varies slightly in the pronunciation of words, 
some suffixes, sometimes in the word itself. Sometimes someone will say, no, that's wrong, that's not how you say it, you should say it like this. We regard everyone who already knows it, who's learned it from their own parents or grandparents as right. They've simply learned another variation of the word. Be aware of this. It need not cause any difficulty or confusion. So they wrote that back in uh, 1990, I think. Um, but yeah, still cause a bit of difficulty and confusion. There's lots, so, so many languages, endangered languages especially, lots of talking in English about what's right, what's wrong, how to do things. A lot of English talk. After decades of keeping the Nuga language hidden from authorities, it could be challenging, or it must have been challenging, for senior people and their families to speak openly about it and reach consensus on fine details. Since the 90s, a small number of committed teachers, and I think there's probably around 10 now, have provided Nunga language education at primary schools, including Woodridge Nunga Community College. Um, language classes are offer, also offered by organisations, um, community organisations, and at least one prison. That's probably one of the surefire ways to learn Nunga is to get chucked in jail. Um, Books by Yelikich Tom Bennell and Ralph Winmar prominently featured New Our Language, ushering in the publication of various illustrated storybooks in the 21st century. Since 2010, New Our Radio aired New Our Language segments, originally hosted by Charmaine Bennell, and the children's television program Wabin Time also premiered in that year on NITV, promoting the language to a national audience. So the language is clearly visible across education and the arts today. It's nevertheless emerging from the devastation of an unjust settler colonial history. Policies implicitly deny fundamental human rights to people who use their language in public, so many senior people literally had the language flogged out of them as children. And among the broader public, there's this rapid movement from denigration and ignorance towards emergent interest, um, but increased appetite for languages to be taught in schools and etc. is welcome, but there's an initial need to develop a community of speakers and resources that engage with the language at a deeper level. Otherwise, we're going to end up promoting a deficit. We've got to have that depth. A diverse range of Nunga words have been recorded since the early 19th century, and is generally consistent with the Nunga spoken today. But analysis of accessible language material also reveals many terms that have fallen out of use for various reasons. The limited use of numeral language and expressive culture of performing arts over the past hundred years has also adversely impacted the retention and the expansion of numeral vocabulary. One of the greatest challenges in sustaining indigenous languages is a, a lack of resources. Not just institutional or archival or funding resources, but a lack of support for creative and intellectual resources. We build a lot of buildings. The UN um, identified nine factors contributing to language vitality. Um, number four is the loss of existing language domains. <coughs> number five is the response to new domains and media. And they're the points that I'd like to focus on. Um, I'm a muso, and so I was always interested in song. And most, or if not, yeah, so I'm going to say most, because it's a, a tricky thing to talk about, as I've written about. Most Aboriginal music is primarily vocal and based in language, so indelibly tied to the diversity of languages. Oh, we've started already. Have a listen. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Yeah.
sitting in the sand. You get in the middle of this sand. And you just feel someone's in the sand. So that's some um, in the shawl there, Nam Rama Yubyam Winma, um, the longest tenured Nuwa language teacher. And I sing a song about the sea with Nana Annie Dapp, who's wearing the glasses, and um, Annie Wanika Close. And they're the niece and the granddaughter of Charlie Dapp, who performed that song on a 1970 field recording by, by Carl Yorg von Brandenstein in the Iatsis archive. So, um, Yes, yeah, since at least 2010, I've been really interested in Nungar song. Learned from a few senior people who carry or carry old songs. And many recent projects on Indigenous song involve working with archival audio recordings and the descendants of recorded singers. Wow, this is moving really far ahead. Could we, um, could my tech person, if, if you're there somewhere in the cosmos, um, Turn off uh, automated timings, please. I'll leave, I'll leave it with you as a, a challenge, <laughs> and a wish, and a hope, and a dream. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, where were we? Oh, yeah, I want to talk about other people doing things. So this idea of going into the archives and bringing songs out and singing them with the, the families of people that sung them before, it's really, really catching on. Um, I just saw uh, Fred Leone performing songs from uh, Queensland and the Northern Territory at the University of Queensland. What an amazing singer that guy is. Just took you to another place. Um, Jesse Hodgetts, been working for a long time on uh, Yampa and Wiradjuri. Um, got Corey there, everyone knows. And um, who else? Um, well, we know Rona Charles and Johnny Divoli reviving Joomba with all the rest of the Joomba mob in the Kimberley. Um, Sally Troy won't help them. Uh, Narama man Patrick Churnside, focusing on the Tarby songs of the Pilbara. A lot of them recorded by um, Von Brandenstein as well. Um, so it's, it's really, it's really catching on this idea of bringing songs back. But, it's tricky. Usually, there's these factors including cultural suppression, the global exploitation of indigenous music, plus various local dynamics associated with the politics of identity and belonging, that can make families and communities wary of sharing old songs widely, even if such songs may have been widely known and sung in the past. The rarer something gets, the more precious it becomes. On the advice of um, these women here, and senior men including Uncle Barry McGuire and Professor Lane Collard, rather than continue to find ways to try and find ways to recirculate old songs, um, I began applying what I learned to create new original songs in the old style that could be shared more freely and have greater positive impact on language revitalization. So one of the first places that that took place was in this. New songs created in the old style invigorated language learning for the cast of what we call Hecate. The Nungara adaptation of Shakespeare's Macbeth. Um, it reframes Macbeth as acting against the laws of nature and Mother Earth herself, embodied, embodied by Hecate, or Hecate, Hecate as uh, the people say it. Hecate, because Hecate, Hecate, sounds too much like Hecate, he going crazy, <laughs> so we move on to that. Um, so this character is often omitted from productions of Macbeth. Um, but my wife thought, well, let's bring her forward as a title character. As part of his initial agenda as artistic director at Uriakin Theatre, Carl J. Morrison came up with the original idea. And, um, yeah, my wife and I co-translated it with editorial guidance from Waraka Roma Yubiyaka Winmar. 
Uh, Akai was the adapter and director while I served as uh, MD, composer, sound designer. And the original cast included um, nine Nyungar actors. Mark Howitt was uh, his Nyungar, his lighting designer. And we had uh, th at least three cultural consultants with us for most of the time. So that's all Nyungar I've spoken on. Pretty unprecedented. And pretty unprecedented that it took a decade. So that's a decade of having something to work towards, having a reason to get together and talk. And we didn't start working on Macbeth until about the last year or so. Most of it was working towards these um, Nyungar only hours where we weren't allowed to speak English at all. And the early ones were very quiet. <laughs> so Shakespeare's work is, is canonical. And Macbeth's been adapted and presented in various non-European, global, and cultural linguistic contexts, particularly in um, Kurosawa's uh, Throne of Blood, the Bollywood um, Makbul, and there's a, a, a um, Renelta Arlux's um, Aquan Macbeth, who was staged partially in Crete. Heck, it's not alone this mobilization of Shakespeare to address local concerns, particularly in language endangerment. Um, based on a 1945 Maori translation of Immersion of Venice, there was a film produced in 2002 to bolster Maori language revitalization. But in uh, this continent, prior to this work, the only other main stage Shakespearean work with an all indigenous cast was Malthouse Theatre's adapt adaptation of King Lear, titled The Shadow King in 2013. Um, it featured a linguistic melange of um, English, Yulbertok and Kalelagoya um, from the Torres Straits, Yongu Bard and Catherine Creole, and was guided by a non-Indigenous director. As a strange anomaly in uh, Australian theatre history, 1999, saw um, Indigenous actors constitute at least half the cast of three separate Shakespearean productions. However, all actors performed in English. But on stage this week, um, Queensland Theatre's uh, Othello includes some lines in Milpatok and Kalalalaya, again from the Torres Straits. So the Torres Straits, so you know, they're doing good. They haven't caught up with Nunez yet, but you know, they're doing good. Heck, it's the first uh, full work of Western-style theatre presented entirely in the Nyungar language and just the second such work in any Aboriginal language of Australia. The first being a 1997 version of Beckett's Waiting for Godot, presented in uh, Bundjalung from northern New South Wales, um, with English surtitles by um, the early um, Bangara National Indigenous Dance Troupe at the 1997 Festival of the Dreaming, um, in Sydney, directed by a uh, non-Indigenous Irish theatre specialist. Uh, but Hecker was presented without surtitles. And it was led by a new director and creative team. So it's more than a significant creative achievement, it's an embodiment of new self-determination. Performing Shakespeare and Newmar has provided a range of very rare opportunities for Newmar and the broader public to actively engage with the language and has provided many challenges. Not least of which is that Shakespeare used well over 20,000 unique English words in his um, poems and plays. The most comprehensive dictionary produced in an Aboriginal language to date is for Walpuri, and it includes over 10,000 entries. While children still grew up with Walpuri as their first language today, to adapt Macbeth into Nyungar, we could not exclusively rely on our own knowledge or the language. Uh, memories of senior speakers. There's a persistent myth that Shakespeare invented hundreds of new English words like bubble and zany, but rather than being a linguistic innovator, Shakespeare was a typical member of an artistic community responding to and reflecting cutting edge developments in the English language of the day to appeal to a contemporary audience. As Professor of English Literature, Jonathan Hope reminds us, language is a collaborative communal efforts Words come into being thanks to the morphological and phonetic resources of the language and its cultural contacts. Not because a few users are divinely gifted wordsmiths. 
Now, while we're not provoking the invention of new words, because we would get told off, Hecate provided us with the opportunity to reintroduce and revitalise archaic vocabulary. For example, the term Kumbaran appears uh, in John Brady's 1845 descriptive vocabulary as, um, as gathering. And then we don't see it again until um, von Brandenstein's 1970 field notes that Doug Marmion helped me locate, um, where Charlie Depp from Esperance uses the word um, to mean um, gathering again. And camp is a shorter word to mean meet. So um, in reviving a term like that that's only got scarce evidence, um, we had to share it amongst ourselves. And while our communal collaborative effort facilitated re-adoption of many old terms like this, this process began with comparing and discussing the merits of archival sources. Outside the intellectual and creative challenge, the main achievement of Hecate was facilitating a brave and supportive space for revitalization and the development of a community of speakers. And it was reverence for Shakespeare in the arts community and Noongar language in the Noongar community that raised the stakes for this work. Carl J. Morrison, um, this is a long quote from him, describes how the cast and creative team approached the project. And Kyle, if you haven't met him, um, he's uh, wearing a thing around his neck there. He's a very animated character. He obviously wasn't on a 6 a.m. flight. <laughs> he says, we really need to learn the difference between respect and reverence. That was the biggest lesson that we learned from working with Bell Shakespeare, theatre company, that helped us out. Peter Evans, who runs that company, started talking about differences between respect and reverence. You can respect anything right up until you are full of its respect and still change it and edit it and augment it. But if you revere something, you're not going to change it. The level of reverence for Shakespeare in this country is stupid, but with the right respect, you can invest in it. It's the exact same idea with Noongar language. You know? There's this reverence around Noongar language and this fear that you can't get it wrong. He says, do you know how many times I've got Noongar language wrong? I've been in front of hundreds of people and Kyle performed at the Globe Theatre doing Noongar sonnets. I performed it and done it wrong in front of hundreds of people and got it wrong, but I'm not going to stop. You've got to fall over and get back up. You've got to stumble. So there was this idea that you can't make a mistake in Shakespeare, you can't make a mistake in your own language because of reverence, but as soon as we get rid of reverence of anything, and then with all respect, you can create everything anew. One of the eternal optimists of this world, Carl J. Morris. <laughs> So Hecate's premiere season closed on 16 February 2020, exactly one month before a state of emergency was declared in WA uh, due to the pandemic. <clears throat> Hecate headlined the Australian's Review of Best Stage Shows of 2020 and was awarded eight performing arts awards, uh, WA Performing Arts Awards, including Best Production, Best New Work. Um, my wife Kylie received the Sydney Myra Performing Arts Award for her work on the, on the, the show. And these achievements were the result of a decade-long time frame, necessary to do it right, to engage with senior speakers, bring them into the room, develop an ensemble. And in this long lead-up, there were many young people, including not just the performers, but other people who participated in, in language gatherings to help nourish a community of speakers. And while some of these gatherings were directly connected to the work, Others were far less formal, held outside or in donated venues and involving Noongar from all walks of life, often with their children in tow. Throughout the whole process, Hecate paid homage to the senior speakers who retained the language through the harshest years of injustice and it kept the focus on the country. Take a bit of a break. And it's slated to tour internationally in 2024. So we'll see what happens. How do you follow that? Oh, my God. 
Bruce Lee film Fist of Fury and Jungar allowed us to work within COVID-19 protocols, keep Jungar actors in work, involve Jungar speakers who'd never acted before, and recruit young Jungar keen to try both. Bruce Lee was the first non-white hero many senior Jungar saw in the movies, so the project was enthusiastically supported. As a film about the tragedy of imperialism and the futility of resistance, it had additional resonance. Now, the original film was released and dubbed in Cantonese as it featured many non-Cantonese speakers. There were Japanese actors in there and there were um, people who spoke Mandarin as their you know, main language in there too. Um, so everyone just, I think the way they filmed it, everyone just talked their own language. And then some, and that, that, I don't know if it was an American actor playing a Russian. <laughs> Bruce Lee dubbed his voice and they pitch shifted it down. <laughs> he dubbed his Cantonese dialect. Um, so even the original was a dub, and as a result, um, it, even the original Cantonese version that got released has some questionable lip-syncing of footage to speech moments. Now the English dub is comically inaccurate and foregoes much of the meaning in the original Cantonese dialogue. You lose maybe a quarter of the story. Um, and such was the popularity of Kung Fu films in the time. And this, like, Fist of Fury is, is a big work. Like, it's a big, serious, serious piece. Um, Bruce Lee had been studying um, Japanese theatre techniques, and that's why he does the over-expressive acting. Like, a lot of artistry and craft went into this. But with the English dub that many people saw, it was rendered as comedy. And the actors almost were dehumanised. So we, again, in a similar way to approaching Shakespeare, approach things with respect, which means we need to be technically as flawless as possible. After working with the most English of English work in Shakespeare, we attempted to use as little English as possible to get from Fistafu's Cantonese into Noir. Melbourne artist and interpreter Felix Chinching Hole glossed the Cantonese with basic English words and then I initially translated into Nyungar without having to completely render the script into English first. Kali and I had to match the Cantonese meaning with Nyungar words that could also fit the movement of characters' lips on screen as perfectly as possible. Um, and then Roma Winmar um, checked everything we did and made sure we were doing it right. After not using surtitles for Hecke, we kind of forgot about the subtitles for this. Um, so it was two days before it was going to screen at Perth Festival. And I cranked out the subtitles for the film. But I didn't have the original English script, so that's... <laughs> one Cantonese, two Nungar, two English. <laughs> so there's some interesting moments where you can see I'm getting a bit... Um, yeah, I'm just having fun. <laughs> 
Um, we'd established a workflow for this sort of dubbing work after doing a couple of episodes of the TV show Little Jane Big Cuz, which you can see on ABC iView. A number of other, other languages have been um, have got dubbed versions of that show. Um, but to our knowledge, uh, Fist of Fury Numero Dao is the first dub of a feature film into a language of this place. It played Australia's major film festivals in 2021 and will soon be available to stream. Now prior, or parallel I guess, to these projects, we also continued to work on Song and Dance. For some people, as senior Gongori woman Ethel Munn from South West Queensland said, it's easier to sing in languages than it is to talk in them. For those of us that can sing, yeah. Like some people. Yeah, maybe not. <laughs> With guidance from Uncle Barry McGuire and, and Nan Yubiyang, actors from Hecate and Fist of Fury and Da and other people, um, we got together, particularly um, Trevor Ryan and Ruben Yorkshire and myself, and developed new dances and songs for bull sharks, dolphins, stingrays, bobtail lizards, dragonflies, groundwater. Trevor um, just completed a master's on, on developing the new dances. And um, the idea of doing these new works is that they can be shared with, with any newer and then eventually the general public. Now, as I can't dance well, I took care of the songs. These works featured in Perth Festival 2022 as part of the Newer Wonderland installation at Perry Lakes in Perth. And here's a little bit of that. <laughs> So, for people to come to Nula Wanderland is to be a part of the, the vibration of old, the vibration of new. How do we incorporate yesterday's with today? Every Nula family that has been uh, walking here in, in this land, in the southwest corner, we are those books that must be continued to be read, but to be heard and to be seen. And Nula Wanderland is that. You know, Wonderland is a place of sharing. Down this way, we don't actually call them boomerangs, we call them Kylie's. And we always tease boys and say, get yourself a girlfriend named Kylie because she'll always come back to you, she will return. Um, when I was learning to be a lecturer, I was actually told that Leonardo da Vinci was the father of aerodynamics. And I picked up one of these and said, I don't think so. I think this thing was designed a few thousand years before that fellow was even born. These are aerodynamically carved for a good return. Water, margin, 
Shark as the superpower of Osmo regulation. It maintains just the right balance of salt and fresh water using its kidneys. Raising awareness and enthusiasm 
building necessary resources, creating corpus materials, and bringing together communities of speakers. Performance may also offer opportunities for connection and empowerment beyond the boundaries of language. One travelling corroboree song, um, my colleague um, Felicity Meekins and my other colleague Miffany Turpin and I are particularly keen on, um, was known by names including Wanji Wanji and performed from Esperance in the southwest to the Victoria River District in the north and from Broome to Wilcannia in New South Wales and is still sung in certain places today. Regarded as a song with no boss, as no one knows its exact language or place of origin. The enduring popularity of Wandi Wandi demonstrates appreciation for Aboriginal song, not just as poetic oral literature, but music. Its primary meaning, not being literal, but functional. It's something to gather around and pass on. Imbued with this ethos, our work, and it is a collective effort to develop and share new our language performance resources is continuing and can be found at mayakenning.com. And I think I'll leave it there and go to questions if that's all right with you.